All right, so for this lecture for unit three, the metabolism unit, we're gonna talk about the pentose phosphate pathway. So really an overview, what is the pentose phosphate pathway? It's an alternate pathway for glucose oxidation. It's independent from glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. So if you recall, we'll have the cell membrane here like this, and glucose is out here like this in the bloodstream, and then it enters through one of those glute transporters. So it comes into the cell, and then it immediately gets phosphorylated by either hexokinase or glucokinase if you're in the liver. And that forms glucose 6 phosphate. And remember, that can go towards glycolysis and go towards glycogen formation. And then it also can go towards the pentose phosphate pathway. So the pentose phosphate pathway, it consists of two phases the oxidative phase and the non oxidative phase. And you can see here where it's divided by this dotted line here. And both of these sets of reactions occur in the cytosol. So first, the oxidative phase. The main thing you want to take away is that it produces NADPH, which is analogous to NADH. It's an electron carrier. And then ribulose 5-phosphate, which is used for nucleotide synthesis. So NADPH, it's used by a number of other metabolic processes, especially fatty acid synthesis. That's the main one it's used by. And then, like we said, ribulose 5-phosphate is used for nucleotide synthesis. The non-oxidative phase, it produces fructose 6-phosphate. You can see that here and here. And then it also produces glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which you can see is here and here. And these are used by glycolysis. So these are intermediates that can then enter into glycolysis. The pentose phosphate pathway, it's present in most tissues, but it has the highest occurrence in adipose tissue, which is significant because NADPH is such a, an important factor in fatty acid synthesis. All right, so first we'll talk about the oxidative phase. There's really two steps here that are really important. And we'll highlight those. So first, glucose 6-phosphate, which is where the starting point here, is converted to 6-phosphogluconolactone, which we show here. And this is catalyzed by the enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. And this actually, you can see with the star here, this takes an NADP and converts it into an NADPH. So you get one NADPH from this reaction. So then 6-phosphogluconolactone is converted into 6-phosphogluconate by this enzyme here, 6-phosphogluconolactonase. Now this isn't a particularly high yield step, but that gets you to here where 6-phosphogluconate is converted into ribulose 5-phosphate by the enzyme 6-phosphogluconate dehydrogenase. And what's important about this step is two things. Is one, it also produces an NADPH and then it produces ribulose 5-phosphate. And so the two main products of this oxidative phase are ribulose 5-phosphate, which as you can see here, can eventually be converted into ribose 5-phosphate and used in nucleic acid synthesis. And then you have two NADPHs here that then are, can be used in other metabolic processes such as fatty acid synthesis. So the non-oxidative phase, so you get down here, ribulose 5-phosphate, this can be converted into ribose 5-phosphate or xylose 5-phosphate via separate enzymes. So one enzyme will take you to rib ribose 5-phosphate, the other will take you to xylose 5-phosphate. Then these two combine together to give you glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and cetoheptulose 7-phosphate. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate can go towards glycolysis. These two can combine to give you fructose 6-phosphate and erythrose 4-phosphate. And then here, fructose 6-phosphate can go towards glycolysis. The other thing here is you can have erythrose 4-phosphate and xylose 5-phosphate combined to give you glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate, which both can go towards glycolysis. So a lot of complicated names here and complicated steps. The, the main things you want to take away from this, the non-oxidative phase, is that it produces glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate, and these are both used in glycolysis. There's no NADPH produced in the non-oxidative phase. So just like how the NAD and NADH ratio influences the, the flux of other metabolic processes in the cell, the NADP-NADPH ratio influences the flux of the pentose phosphate pathway. So if you have increased levels of NADPH, you're going to have decreased flux through the pentose phosphate pathway. And that makes sense because it, since the pentose phosphate pathway is actually responsible for about 50% of the NADPH in the cell, 
if you already have a high number of this already present, then there's no need to keep producing more of it. So processes that, that actually oxidize NADPH to NADP increase the flux through the pentose phosphate pathway. So let's say you have a high level of fatty acid synthesis going on, and then you're oxidizing NADPH to NADP, then those can then enter into the pentose phosphate pathway, and then you can convert those back to NADPH. And then the other thing is high levels of cholesterol synthesis oxidize a lot of NADPH, and then also reduction of glutathione, which is a process that's particularly important in the red blood cells, as we'll talk more about in the clinical pearls section. This is another process that uses up a lot of NADPH. So the big takeaway is that the pentose phosphate pathway, because it produces such a significant percentage of NADPH, is intimately tied to these processes that use NADPH. All right, so now we're going to cover a clinical pearl relevant to the pentose phosphate pathway. Glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase, or G6PD, deficiency is a very high yield disease because it ties together a lot of different concepts from biochemistry, hematology, pathology, and then even here some genetics because the inheritance is X linked recessive. So this is very common to see on exams, biochem exams, pathology exams, or exams. So again, glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase catalyzes, we should say, the formation, apologize, there's an error here, the formation of 6-phosphoglucanolactone from glucose 6-phosphate, which most importantly produces an NADPH. And so we come down here to the figure, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, it's yielding an NADPH here, and this NADPH is used to ensure adequate supply of reduced glutathione, or GSH, which then acts to neutralize free radicals in the cell. And so we show hydrogen peroxide here. This can be broken down into hydroxyl radicals like this, and these can really wreak havoc on the cell and cause a lot of damage. So this is a significant protective mechanism, especially in red blood cells. So glutathione reductase, which is this enzyme here, it takes this NADPH that was yielded by glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase and uses it to reduce glutathione disulfide, GSSG, to give us reduced glutathione here. And then in the process, it regenerates an NAD+, which can be reused by the pentose phosphate pathway. So then you have this enzyme glutathione peroxidase, which combines reduced glutathione with organic hydroperoxides, which are shown here, to form water and alcohols, in a sense neutralizing these potentially really damaging chemicals in the cell. And this pathway is the only source of reduced glutathione in red blood cells. So if this enzyme is deficient, you're going to have significantly less NADPH, which then really significantly inhibits this process to protect the red blood cell. So again, we already said this, significant decrease in the amount of NADPH produced. Um, as a result, when glutathione is used up by red blood cells in this patient, there's no more protective measures against free radicals. And then one of the results of having a high number of free radicals in the cell is that eventually hemoglobin gets damaged and accumulates in the red blood cells. And this is actually can be seen under the microscope. It's, it's observed as Heinz bodies under the microscope. And you can see that here. Here's these little pink colored uh, collections here, these dense circular like structures here. Those are what are called Heinz bodies. That can help differentiate from pyruvate kinase deficiency, which is a disease we talked about in the glycolysis lecture. You will not see Heinz bodies in pyruvate kinase deficiency, but definitely this is something you'd see in G6PD deficiency. So when these patients are really vulnerable is during states of oxidative stress, and this can really, this result in hemolytic anemia, which is the source of a lot of the problems for these patients. So the triggers are certain foods, such as fava beans, certain medicines, such as sulfonamides or antimalarials, and then infections can also result in this as well, bacterial or viral infection, because infections pr produce a lot of stress on the body. And so significant numbers of damaged red blood cells result, and then they're broken down. Because remember, when you have damaged red blood cells, they eventually get broken down, which is the process known as hemolysis. So what's important to know here is that the patients are typically asymptomatic until they're exposed to triggers. So let's say, you know, a patient develops a, a bacterial infection, and then they develop these symptoms here that are a result of hemolysis. Because that bacterial infection produces a lot of stress on the body, a lot of free radicals, the red blood cells aren't able to handle it, so they get damaged, and that triggers hemolysis, which then can manifest clinically with jaundice, dark urine, fatigue, shortness of breath, and these are mainly due because this is a type of anemia.
So they have de decreased levels of red blood cells. And then splenomegalia is a result of, remember the spleen essentially cleans up those damaged red blood cells. And so the way you get jaundice and dark urine, if you remember, is if you have red blood cell damage and then breakdown, remember red blood cells are essentially bags of hemoglobin. So then you get hemoglobin released out into, and then that gets broken down. And when hemoglobin gets broken down, it gets broken down into unconjugated bilirubin. And then that's what gives you jaundice, which is yellowing of the skin and, and of the eyes. So jaundice, and then also can give you dark urine. So a stem would typically have, so a patient was otherwise normal, they developed some kind of infection, or they took one of those medications we mentioned on the previous slide, and then they developed these symptoms. And so you definitely want to be suspicious for G6PD deficiency. All right, lastly here, the way you diagnose G6PD deficiency is you're going to get a CBC with reticulocytes. Remember, that's indicative of bone marrow activity and bone marrow function. You're going to get a peripheral blood smear, and the main thing you're looking for on that is the Heinz bodies. You could do a Coombs test. It's going to be negative. Remember, that's more used to positively diagnose autoimmune diseases that are acting on and destroying red blood cells. You'll get serum levels of the following. So liver enzymes, these are going to be normal because it doesn't really involve the liver damage. Lactate dehydrogenase will be elevated, but that's more of a general marker of just tissue damage and cell destruction. And so again, remember LDH is contained in cells. If cells lyse, that'll be released into the serum, and that's why you see it elevated. Here, red blood cells are being lysed, hence LDH is getting released. And then haptoglobin will also will be decreased. And haptoglobin is a protein that binds to free hemoglobin in the blood. So you have a store, uh, you know, a certain amount of haptoglobin, it binds with free hemoglobin, and that causes the levels of haptoglobin in the blood to go down because it gets bound up by this free hemoglobin that's being released by hemolysis. So the way you're going to treat these patients is avoiding food and medications that could trigger an inflammatory response and increase levels of free radicals that this patient would be unable to handle at the red blood cell level. So you're really going to avoid any of those triggers like that that cause hemolysis. And then you could do a splenectomy and then also supplement with folate as well. All right, so that closes out our discussion of the pentose phosphate pathway and then also glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency.